uh, introduce our next next speaker. So ne our next speaker, Robert uh, uh, McFarlane, uh, he is at MIT and uh, he is uh, uh, he has PhD from Northwestern University and uh, he is uh, known for his work on uh, nanocomposite polymers and uh, it would it is really great pleasure to uh, hear from him uh, today. So, Robert, uh, please uh, come and uh, um, deliver your talk. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, just for a little bit of context, I am trained as a chemist, and I'm now in a material science department, so this will be a little bit uh, of a departure from perhaps what you're used to today. Um, but our work is primarily focused on material synthesis, so there is at least some commonality and some connection here. We try and develop new materials with structures and properties that don't currently exist. Uh, and most of what we do is focused on uh, polymeric materials, because polymers are a broad class of materials that has a wide set of properties and therefore a wide set of potential applications, uh, ranging from things that are very uh, lightweight and low density to things that are much stronger and more durable, things that are stretchy, things that can be uh, uh, stable at high temperatures. There's a pretty wide variety of properties you can get simply by choosing which uh, uh, monomers you use in the polymer synthesis. However, that doesn't mean that they can do everything. There is a fundamental limit to what polymers can actually achieve. So if you look at these Ashby plots or just general plots of the um, property space we can access, what we can see is that polymers have a range of different properties, but it doesn't cover the full space that we might actually want to access. So compared to other materials like metals or ceramics, Polymers typically are much softer, they are processed at lower temperatures, but they also therefore are not stable at super high temperatures. They tend to be very insulating, they tend to be less dense, and so as a result they have a lot of potential applications, but there are inherent limitations to what we can actually do with them. If we wanted to expand beyond this, one of the things we can think about is making a composite. Uh, a standard way to improve the property space that polymers can access is by throwing in nanofillers, the quintessential example being tire rubber, which is a, a polymer which has been uh, filled with something like carbon black or, or uh, tiny silica particles. Um, this is commonly used to improve the mechanical performance of the material because as soon as you put some sort of uh, rigid nanoscale object inside the polymer matrix, it affects how the polymer chains flow past each other. And this results in a strengthening or a toughening of the material. The other thing we can think about, though, is that when we add in these nanofillers, they have their own inherent properties. And so if I can load up the polymer with a large quantity of these different types of filler particles, I can impart their inherent properties to the composite itself. So for example, things like thermal conductivity or refractive index, where inorganic materials tend to be uh, um, much more varied in their property space that they can access, that allows us to give polymers properties that we wouldn't be able to access from the polymers alone. And so this is a pretty fruitful and very rich area of research. However, there is an inherent challenge with this, which is that if you take those nanofillers and you throw them into the polymer and simply mechanically mix them, the particles are not happy. Uh, the particles would rather interface with each other than with the polymers that surround them. And so what you find is that at even fairly low loadings, the particles will start to aggregate. So this is a, a, a quintessential example here of uh, silica particles being thrown into polystyrene and they're measuring the strain to failure. You can see at very low weight percents, it starts to increase the overall mechanical strength, but as you continue to add them, you very quickly get to something that is even worse than it was uh, when it was just the neat polystyrene on its own. And that's because those particles, the interface uh, between the particle and the polymer is not favorable, and therefore they tend to aggregate. This serves as a site for things like crack propagation. Uh, the other example that I like is shown here. Uh, this is, uh, you can't really tell because the image is nice and transparent, uh, or sorry, the polymer film is nice and transparent, but this is a polycarbonate film that's in between the camera and what's actually being taken a photo of here. What you can see is that it's nice and transparent, but at just two weight percent of aluminum nanoparticles, you've significantly increased the overall haze. And again, that's because you're starting with tiny nanoscale uh, particles that don't like to be in the polymer, so they immediately begin to aggregate, and they cause these large light scattering aggregation effects. And so that, that is sort of the fundamental challenge that we're trying to address with our research. How can we better interface the inorganic particles with the polymers to increase the property space we can access? And so our solution is this. It's what we call the polymer brush grafted nanoparticle, a brush particle. Uh, we didn't invent it, but we use it because it is an uh, um, incredibly valuable tool in the nanocomposite development. 
By taking this particle and grafting a bunch of polymer brushes on its surface, we have two different uh, um, benefits. The first is that the surface of this particle now looks like the rest of the polymer in the matrix. And so it makes it much more compatible. So these things are much less likely to phase, segregate, uh, and aggregate. The other th advantage is this is a lot of steric bulk. Even if the interface is not perfectly favorable, when the particles try to come together, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the way that prevents them from aggregating and forming a large uh, uh, aggregated mess. And so as a result, these brush particles are a pretty uh, valuable building block to look at. So uh, I'm going to talk about three basic uh, stories today that each are going to cover a specific advantage of the brush particle. The first is how they alter the overall chain behavior of both the polymers on the particle and the polymer matrix around them. Um, second, I'm going to talk about how they prevent aggregation. And the third, I'm going to talk about how they actually can control the way the particles talk to one another inside the matrix. Uh, so let me start here with this idea uh, of um, changing the way the polymers flow. And I'm going to start with, this is the most industrially relevant uh, application we've targeted so far. And this is uh, uh, actually industry-sponsored research trying to improve pressure-sensitive adhesives, or tape. So uh, just as by way of background, uh, um, when you have a pressure-sensitive adhesive, the way it works is you have two layers. You have a fairly rigid backing layer, that's a polymer that is uh, stiff and is not going to flow. And then on its underside, you have a elastomer, a material that very easily flows when you apply mechanical force. So when you take the tape and you press it onto a surface, the elastomer flows into all of the little microstructural features, forms a really high surface area uh, contact, and that's what allows it to actually function as an adhesive. When you try and remove that tape, there are two things that can happen. What we generally want to happen is what's called adhesive failure. This is where the bonds holding the elastomer to the substrate are the weakest part, and therefore they, they would break. So if you ever take, say, scotch tape and peel it off a surface and have a nice clean uh, surface left behind, that's adhesive failure. If you do that with something much stronger, for example, duct tape, and you have that gunk left behind, that went through cohesive failure. Basically, what happened was the bonds holding the elastomer to the substrate were so strong that when you pull the tape off, the elastomer tore itself apart. And you, that's why you have that residue left behind. This is generally a negative thing that you don't want to happen. And so this is what uh, uh, the company that sponsored us, uh, Tessa Tape, it's a German adhesives company, this is what they wanted us to help address. The way you typically solve this cohesive failure problem is you simply add in crosslinks. So if I have my nice polymer matrix where all the polymer chains are entangled and I add in some sort of chemistry that forms strong bonds between them, for example, this is a standard uh, pressure-sensitive adhesive uh, uh, which can be cross-linked by the addition of these aluminum ions. If I've now got strong bonds linking my polymers together, uh, it's much more, less likely to undergo that cohesive failure. The bonds holding the polymer together are less likely to pull apart. The problem with this is that while that does increase the cohesive strength of the tape, it also significantly decreases its ability to actually function as an adhesive. Because as I mentioned, the way these wor uh, adhesives work is that elastomer has to flow into all of the microstructural features. If I provide a lot of crosslinks, yes, it's much stronger, but the polymers can't flow. So you make it so it's less likely to cohesively fail, but it doesn't really function as tape anymore. So this is the question that we wanted to address, and we figured that we could solve it with these polymer grafted nanoparticles. Our hypothesis here was that a particle grafted with a polymer brush could act as a central node. So the idea is that if any one of these polymer chains connected to the particle forms that covalent connection with the matrix, that matrix is now connected to every other polymer that's hooked onto this particle. And so as a result, instead of having in a large number of cross-linking points, we can simply add in a small number, and this node will reach out and form a much more cohesive network. So individually, the polymer chains can still flow, but they'll be connected in a strong cohesive network. So this is the basic uh, system we started with. These are 50 nanometer silica particles grafted with this standard polymer that's used in pressure-sensitive adhesives. Uh, we're going to embed them in, again, a standard polymer matrix used for PSAs. Uh, um, so the way we uh, test this is we mix the particles and the polymers together. We uh, slap them between two pieces of steel, and then we do a shear test, basically measuring how much t uh, force it takes to shear this adhesive apart. So what we can see is that compared to a control sample with just the polymer, that's these traces here in black, and a control sample where we just threw bare silica particles into that, that's in red here, those two samples did not really see any real difference in the overall uh, shear strength as we added more of the uh, nanoparticle. 
However, when we added the brush-coated particle, you can see that at max loading, there's about 25% increase in the overall shear strength. So this is indicating that these materials can act to strengthen the material. Um, to give a sense of how this actually might affect performance in the real world, we did two basic tests. The first is a 90-degree peel test. So this is essentially the act of peeling a tape off a substrate. Uh, and the other is what's called the hang test, where basically, we, instead of using a very sensitive shear sensor, uh, shear stress uh, measurement, we basically hung a weight off of these steel plates and measured how long it took before they fell. You can see from the peel tester that there was not really any effect on the overall adhesion. The tape is just as good as it was before at sort of being tape. But the overall cohesive strength tripled at this uh, maximum point. So in other words, these materials held together much, much more strongly. So the basic take home here is that these brush particles don't impair the ability of the PSA to act as tape, but they do significantly improve its overall cohesive capabilities. And so this is very encouraging. Uh, but Tessa said, well, this is great, but all these materials here, they're all solvent born, meaning that in order to mix this up, we had to use organic uh, solvents, which are not really green. They're not really great for the environment. And so they wanted us to look at waterborne adhesives. So these are materials that can be cast from water, which is a much more environmentally friendly method. Uh, and so what we did uh, was we changed up our, our formulation a little bit. So the way that a, a waterborne adhesive works is you have uh, a latex. Basically, all of your adhesive polymer is uh, bound up in these little colloid bundles. They have some surfactants on their surface that make them compatible with water. And so what happens is you have this material in water, you dry it uh, on a front surface, all the water goes away, and now all of these particles, they begin to coalesce. The problem is because you have these surfactant on those surfaces of the particle, when they coalesce, they don't always fully coalesce. You'll end up with these sort of void spaces. And again, these are mechanically unstable. If I try and uh, uh, mechanically damage this, these voids are where cracks are going to originate and propagate. So what we figured we could do is we could throw in some of our PGNPs into the aqueous phase. So the idea here is that we're going to follow the same basic process, but when the water dries out and everything coalesces, if we have our polymer grafted nanoparticles in the aqueous phase, the polymer should reach out and grab onto adjacent uh, latex colloids that are bridging them and filling in a lot of these gaps and making the material much stronger. So I will go through this uh, relatively quickly here, but the basic idea here is we're measuring the overall adhesion again. We can see that compared to uh, um, uh, the sample with no particles in it, there's no real change in the overall adhesion within air. There's a slight increase here at one of the, these values. Um, that's, we think, just due to uh, random error in the sample. But largely, these materials are just as good at, as tape as the bare waterborne uh, PSAs were. However, again, if we look at the overall cohesive strength, now we see even, even more dramatic impact in the overall ability of these materials to hold together. And we think what's going on here is essentially it has to do with how the particles are arranging themselves inside the material. If we look at this low loading sample, you can see that what we have here are a bunch of discrete individual particles. So these are particles that can maybe reach out and grab onto one or two of the different latex particles and strengthen it a little bit. If we go to the max shear stress here, what we find are a lot of these very elongated, highly anisotropic uh, chains of particles. So this means we have these particles that are, are stuck together into large uh, groups that have a large surface area to volume ratio. So they can basically bridge a lot of these different latex particles and provide a significant strengthening effect. We see a slight dip because if we keep going further, those aggregates tend to be less sort of fractal or elongated, and they become much more agglomerated into things that are kind of spheroids. And those spheroids don't have as nice surface area to volume ratio. And so the end result here is that if we tailor it appropriately, we can have about a 35% increase in the overall strengthening of the material. So this, I think, provides a, a good example of how these polymer grafted nanoparticles could be used as functional building materials to make interesting types of structures. Um, so let me move on to the, the second story here, uh, um, which is uh, being able to make high inorganic content composites. And so the question we had from the first work was these particle, uh, polymer grafted particles are really fantastic for uh, uh, functioning as additives to improve polymer performance. But what if we just wanted to build a material entirely out of the brush particles themselves? They are inherently composites. They have an inorganic core and some polymer brushes. And so as a result, we might be able to make a single component composite without having to worry about embedding them into a polymer matrix. Again, we're not the first people to have this idea. This has been studied for a couple of decades. But most of the research on these brush-coated particles falls into one of two regimes, uh, uh, very nicely highlighted in this uh, uh, plot right here. If we have a short polymer brush, 
meaning that we have a large amount of inorganic content and very short sort of polymer brush coatings. Uh, that means we can have a, a dominating effect of whatever the inorganic properties are on the composite. But because the polymers are short, they don't entangle very well and the mechanical properties are incredibly poor. These materials are very, very brittle. If we make the polymers much longer, we can make materials that have the same or better mechanical properties than the polymer would on its own. But in order to reach that regime, the polymers have to be so long that we're restricted to just a few weight percent of the particles. So we're stuck in sort of this, this uh, dichotomy where either we have high inorganic content or good mechanical properties, but we can never have both. Because the only way you've been able to get good mechanical properties is to make the polymers long enough to entangle. So thankfully, I had a very clever graduate student who looked at this and said, well, we don't really need them to entangle. That's just there to give them mechanical strength. If we could make them mechanically strong without entanglement, we could sit down here in this, this regime and still have mechanically strong materials. And so what we figured we could do is instead of relying on mechanical entanglement, the polymers wrapping around each other to actually make them strong, we're just going to covalently bond these polymers together. So we're going to use short polymer brushes. And then after we've processed the material into the appropriate form, we're just going to covalently cross-think them. So now this would be kind of like a standard thermostat, like an epoxy, where instead of relying on polymer entanglement, you're just forming chemical bonds that strongly link these particles together. So this is the first example of what we're calling cross-thinkable nanoparticles, or XNPs. Uh, these XNPs, uh, the first iteration, contained a silicon nanoparticle core. The polymer brush contained this glycidyl methacrylate monomer, which has this thing here called an epoxide. If you actually uh, take this epoxy and you uh, combine it with a difunctional amine, so this is a molecule that can actually uh, link together uh, two of these different epoxies, you heat it up to about 175 degrees C for a few hours, you now form covalent bonds between these polymers, meaning that you have a material that has a strong covalent network linking all these polymers together. So to give you a back of the envelope calculation uh, of how much inorganic content we think we could load into this, if we look at the basic numbers that we were able to achieve in the synthesis of these, we should be able to achieve up to about 60 weight percent silica within our material. So the question is, does this work? We know we can synthesize them, but what do they do when we actually process them into a material? So it turns out they actually work beautifully. So this is an example of one of these XNP materials cast onto a silicon substrate. So if you've ever looked at silicon, it's very shiny and reflective. So what you're looking at here is actually the surface of our, or the ceiling of our lab. Uh, because what we have is a very reflective mirror substrate that we've cast onto it basically an invisible film. So this is an, an invisible film because these particles are prevented from aggregating, even though we're at 55 weight percent of the silica. And not only do they not aggregate and cause haze, they're also strong enough that we can peel them off the surface and we have this almost invisible freestanding film structure. As a point of comparison, if we just took 55 weight percent of those same silica particles and threw them into the same massive polymer, you can see it's now this sort of ugly mess because the particles aggregated. And if we try and peel this off the surface, it just shattered into a million pieces. So this is a really great way to actually make high inorganic content composites that can be processed just like polymers. Um, I, will, I won't go into the detail of all of the mechanical testing because I think this is a much more illustrative example. This is a scratch test. So we basically took these films, took a nano indenter, plowed it into the surface and dragged it across to see how much we could damage it. You can see that before we cross-think the material, that nano indenter plowed through it like the particles uh, were just sort of uh, soft putty, right? So these uh, scratches are, are, are really easy to uh, um, make in the material without the cross-thinking. After we cross-linked it, though, you can see this, they became much, much more scratch resistant. In fact, these are what are called, uh, these are helium ion microscope images, not standard SEM, because when we took these scratches to the standard SEM and tried to find them, we couldn't find them. They're basically so scratch resistant that the scratches were almost impossible to find. So this is a much, much more uh, mechanically robust material that could be useful for things like coatings for glasses or, or lenses or other types of materials because it remains transparent, even though it's mechanically very hard. The problem with this is that this particular chemistry really only works uh, um, if we do it by um, deposition from liquid solvent. So we have to drop cast them on a material. And that's great for films and coatings, but you're not going to build a three-dimensional structure by drop casting it one, you know, 10 micron uh, layer at a time. So we went into the literature and tried to find a different chemistry that might make this a little bit more uh, um, applicable. And so we found uh, um, from papers back in actually the 1950s and 1960s, people were looking at methacrylates, a very common commodity polymer, and they were investigating a problem they saw, that if you heated a methacrylate in air to about 150 to 200 degrees Celsius, uh, they would actually sort of turn brown and become very brittle. 
And what they found was happening was basically there was a, a chemistry that happened in air at those high temperatures, where these side chains of the polymers would react with one another to form what's called an anhydride group. So they investigated this in the, as a negative thing. This is something they definitely wanted to avoid uh, because it was causing their polymer to turn brown and become brittle. We figured we could turn a bug into a feature because if we took a particle and we grafted it with the same sorts of chemistry, we should be able to make a, now a single component uh, a nanoparticle composite that doesn't need any sort of cross-linking agent, meaning we could make one material, cast it into a film, and then cross-link it just by adding heat. The nice thing about this is it's this particular methacrylate, this polyhexyl methacrylate, at room temperature is very soft. It has the um, uh, mechanical properties of, I'd say, like toothpaste, uh, maybe not quite as soft as silly putty, but it's pretty easy to get it to flow. So what we can do is we can synthesize these particles, cast them into a particular form, and then use just a little bit of heat to press them or mold them or shape them into a particular form. And then once they're actually uh, uh, cast into that form, we can heat them up and cross them. So if we uh, examine the, uh, these uh, um, rectangles here, these are these particles. So initially, this is uh, what it looks like before we do any cross-thinking. As we subject it to more and more cross-thinking, you'll notice it does sort of turn orange. This is a, a uh, side reaction that happens. Uh, turns out when you burn things in air, they tend to turn brown a little bit. Um, so maybe not so great for optical applications, but they do have significantly improved mechanical properties. So this is the initial uh, uh, example of a material. So this is just showing that they are nice and, and moldable into uh, um, an obvious shape. Initially, they have a tensile module, so about five megapascals. So again, very easily compliant. Uh, they can be sort of molded like uh, toothpaste. Once we cross-link it, though, the modulus goes up by a factor of 1,000. So it goes from five megapascals to five gigapascals. So this is a standard, fairly rigid plastic. And this is despite the fact that this is roughly 50 to 60 weight percent of silicon nanoparticles. So this is a material that is uh, as much or more inorganic content by weight, but it can be processed the same way a polymer does, and it has the same mechanical properties of a polymer. It's amenable to all sorts of different processing techniques and methods, so molding and extrusion and vacuum forming, meaning that we can make it into complex three-dimensional structures. So an obvious question might be, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to load these materials up with inorganic content? Well, silica itself is a cheap commodity material that's easy to work with, but it's kind of the vanilla of ceramics. It's not really terribly interesting on its own. However, there are other oxides that have much more intriguing properties that you might want to load into a composite. So we chose to investigate alumina. Alumina is nice because we can use the same chemistry to put the polymer on its surface. But alumina has a specific benefit in that it has a very high thermal conductivity. So it has a thermal conductivity of about 30 watts per meter Kelvin. So the idea here was using the same chemistry, we should be able to make a material that has high thermal conductivity, but because there is a uh, polymer coating around each of the particles, this is going to be electrically insulating. So the potential applications here are, say, uh, coatings or protective layers for batteries or microelectronics, things that are going to produce a lot of heat that you want to dump into the environment very quickly so you don't fry your device, but they need to be electrically insulated. So I will uh, uh, spare you the details on the mechanical properties. Uh, suffice it to say, they are the same as what I showed you before. In fact, I cheated a little bit. These are actually the mechanical properties of our alumina. But they're the same as the silica, so I feel justified in, in, in cheating you a little bit. But they are good and mechanically robust once they've been cross-linked. What about their thermal properties? Well, if we look at the thermal properties of the polymer and then the thermal properties of the maximally loaded uh, alumina composite, you can see they increase by a factor of about four. So a significant increase in the thermal conductivity of these materials. It's not perfect. We haven't solved the problem just yet because, uh, as I mentioned, the thermal conductivity of alumina on its own is about 25 to 30 watts per meter Kelvin, and here we're just sort of cresting one. So we're not really thermally conductive just yet, but we are significantly more thermally conductive than the polymer alone, indicating there's a lot of potential for this in the future. And so in terms of where we're headed, we're developing methods now that can keep the overall transparency of these materials, uh, but take them from something that is easily compliant when uh, pre-molding to something that is very rigid uh, once it's actually been cross-linked. Uh, we're looking at other methods to cross-link them into complex materials, and we're looking at more complex uh, um, sorts of optical structures, uh, such as photonic crystals or anti-reflection coatings. All right, so for the last part of my talk, um, I want to talk about something that is not really industrially relevant just yet, but is sort of pointing at how we can transition uh, um, some more complex ideas into things that might be more functional and scalable. And that's understanding how we can actually make ordered arrays of particles within the matrix.
So if we look at the structures that uh, I was showing from here, uh, for example, these alumina particle composites, they're completely random. There's no real ordering or organization to the particles. So the question would be, how would we actually control the way the particles are organized in three-dimensional space within the structure? And so the, the, what we figured was we needed to give away those, for those particles to talk to one another. They have to be able to communicate in the composite so they can self-organize into some kind of structure. And so we've invented a building block we call the nanocomposite tecton, or NCT, uh, because we like three-letter acronyms in our lab. So the NCT, it's again an inorganic particle coated with a polymer brush, but the unique wrinkle is now at the end of each of these polymer chains, we have some sort of what's called a supermolecular binding group. Basically, this is some sort of molecular structure where complementary molecular groups will form a dynamic bond with one another. So these are not permanent bonds, but they're very labile interactions. The idea is that if two particles have complementary supermolecular groups, those particles will form a reversible bond with one another, and we can use that to tell the particles how to self-organize into different structures. So we've done this with multiple compositions, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on this one right here, which is our first big success. So these are gold nanoparticles. We use gold not because it's uh, particularly uh, useful, uh, but because it's very easy to work with. And we're dealing with things at small scales, so uh, it doesn't really cost a huge amount to make them, as you might think. But gold is nice because we can functionalize with polymers using a thiol moiety. So we're going to take a gold nanoparticle. We're going to synthesize just basic polystyrene, put this thiol at the end. Thiol is just has a strong affinity for gold. So if I throw this polymer at the particle, it just sticks on and forms the brush. At the other end of the polymer chain, we're going to put either what's called a thymine group or a diaminopyridine group. So these two groups right here, uh, the specifics are not important, but the idea is they form these nice hydrogen bonding pairs between them, meaning that you have a weak reversible bond that links these particles together. If I uh, synthesize these particles and I put them into organic solvent like toluene, they will remain more or less indefinitely soluble, just suspended in that uh, toluene solvent. But as soon as I combine these complementary particles, they will immediately aggregate and precipitate out of solution because these hydrogen bonds are now linking them together. Hydrogen bonds are very weak, though, so we can very easily disrupt them by simply heating them up. Uh, the temperature depends on the actual design of the particles, where we're talking 40 or 50 degrees Celsius. If we heat them up, they dissociate and go back to being free in solution. If we cool them down, they reassemble, and we can cycle through this without actually changing anything about the properties of the material. So the basic take home here is this is now a way to get the particles to aggregate that is very thermally labile. It can be processed at very low temperature. Okay. The obvious question though is, does this uh, uh, apply to other particles as well? And yes, we can do this with many different types of constructs, different metals, oxides, perovskites, uh, um, uh, and other types of structures. Uh, my student even did this with Prussian blue particles. For some reason, I don't fully understand, but it does work. It makes nice, pretty blue aggregates. But the basic idea here is this now is a modular way to get these particles to assemble to one another. Okay, but do they actually form those beautiful arrays, those ordered structures that we were targeting? The answer is yes, they do. So this is x-ray scattering data of uh, some of these gold nanoparticle samples that we've assembled and given just a little bit of thermal energy. What happens is those weak labile bonds with just a little bit of thermal energy, instead of fully dissociating, individual ones become very dynamic. So what happens is the particles sort of randomly walk around each other and reorganize until they adopt a state where they're maximizing the number of bonds that can form. And so it turns out that is an ordered array of uh, particles. So these are x-ray scattering data of body-centered cubic lattices of particles. The black trace right under here is the predicted x-ray scattering pattern for the lattice uh, that I've shown here in the unit cell. And the colored data is the actual uh, um, uh, data itself. So we can make ordered arrays of these particles with different particle sizes and polymer lengths. The reason I'm showing you x-ray data and not actual pictures is because these are, again, colloidally assembled, meaning they're assembled from an, a suspension, a liquid solvent. And if you take that liquid away, all the ordering goes away. Basically, as you dry out the solvent, capillary forces pull the particles apart, and all of the ordering that you worked so hard to achieve is lost. There's some regions, maybe here, you can kind of see some orderings retained, but by and large, it's a mess. So the question is, how can we retain that ordering and actually make a functional, macroscopic, solid material? Well, it turns out there's a trick you can play. Uh, polymers, depending on what solvent you put them in, will either want to adopt a really extended state or a really compact state. So if the solvent is good for the polymer, it's going to want to expand and occupy as much volume as it can. If you instead transition to a poor solvent, the polymer will rather associate with itself than the solvent molecules. And so what happens is the polymer contracts. So we figured if we take these assemblies, which we assemble in a good solvent, 
where the polymer is really outstretched. We transfer it to a poor solvent. All the polymer will collapse. Uh, the lattice will collapse. And as a result, what we have is now a material that is much, much shrunken and therefore has much less solvent to evaporate. And so what we see is that if we assemble these materials in toluene, so you can see the X-ray scattering pattern right here showing us a nice ordered lattice. As we gradually transition from this to a poor solvent for polystyrene, this N-decane, you can see the same basic scattering pattern is present. It's just shifting to larger and larger scattering angles. And what this means is we've got a same basic structure. It's just gradually collapsing. And once we get it into full N-decane, we can simply boil off the N-decane uh, at room temperature. And the uh, sample now is a fully dried solid, but it has that ordering retained. So we can now take this to the electron microscope and see what these things look like. And what we were surprised to find is not only do we have ordering, we actually have well-ordered, faceted structures. So these things are not just BCC lattices, they are faceted single crystal structures. So this shape here is called a rhombic to decahedron. Uh, rhombic to decahedron is the wolf shape. It's the predicted thermodynamic shape these particles should get uh, form into based on everything we know from uh, atomic crystallization. And we can do this very reliably and repeatedly. Um, this process happens very quickly, so this is actually a video right here. Each of these is a single crystal. I'm going to play the video. It's sped up just a little bit, but if we heat them apart, all the particles dissociate. We're going to start cooling, and within about two minutes, you can see they immediately start to reform. And it doesn't really matter how quickly we form them, they are always the same quality of crystal. So the reason this is important is twofold. Number one, it allows us to study these things uh, uh, in a manner that is much more amenable to scale up. And secondly, it allows us to tune the overall size of those crystallites. So we can make those rhombic dodecahedra very small or very large and everything in be. So we can make different types of structures as well. I'm gonna skip over this because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but the question be became, uh, um, we can make these structures, but these structures at their largest were about 100 microns. So that is really interesting for fundamental studies of crystallization and assembly, but not so great for actually making a macroscopic material. Uh, the student who uh, initially developed this, I, I used to joke that uh, uh, he was not allowed to graduate until he gave me a single crystal the size of my head. Um, he very rightly told me that was ridiculous. Uh, and so he said, uh, well, how about a compromise? Instead of giving you a single crystal that is the size of your head, how about I make a polycrystalline material? So we know from basic metals and ceramics that if you have a nanopowder and you heat it and you squeeze it, you can turn that nanopowder into a sintered bulk material. Basically, you break the bonds between individual atoms in the powder and it densifies into a solid construct. This is how you can make all sorts of complex structures with just a nanoparticle-based powder. The problem with this is that it typically takes really uh, high pressures, really high temperatures. But again, remember, our particles are being held together by just hydrogen bonds. And so if we take those uh, single crystal structures and we simply centrifuge them at about 20,000 RCF for about 10 minutes at more or less room temperature, they do indeed densify. As you can see, we now have gone from individual uh, particles to now a fully densified structure. But if we zoom in and look at it, all of the ordering that we uh, initially created is maintained. So what we now have is a material that has a specified uh, organization of the particles at the nanoscale, but also a specified microstructure. And we can use the initial uh, size of the particles we've created to control aspects of the microstructure. So I'm showing here examples of being able to control the grain size. We can also control things like dislocations or other types of defects that arise. So the last thing just to mention here is whether or not we can actually fully go to the macroscopic scale. So we know that we can take these structures and we can center them a very low energy process into a large macroscopic puck. If we then take that and press it into a mold that has this recognizable shape, Sure enough, they actually adopt that macroscopic shape of the mold. But if we cut that in half and either look at it under the microscope or with X-ray uh, scattering, the quality of those ordering is maintained. So in other words, what we have now is a material that has 10 to the seventh uh, um, length scale control over its structure. The composition of the particles in the polymer, the nanoscale organization, the microstructure, and now the macroscopic form. And so we're quite excited to see how this actually affects things like structure property relationships or can be applied to other types of materials. So this is an example we recently published showing the mechanical properties of these. We're also targeting things with interesting optical or magnetic or other types of phenomena as well. So there are a number of people I have to thank. In particular, the, the work was primarily done by uh, uh, Kyung Tai, my postdoc, uh, uh, Carl, a graduate student, and a few other graduate students that were not uh, listed here because they have graduated. Uh, I thank our funding sources, uh, Tessa Tape, for the initial work, and then the Air Force, uh, the uh, um, uh, ARO, and the ONR for the latter work that I talked about. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions.